work from home and virtual workforces were pandemic staples and then this autumn many organizations were moving forward with a slow return to the office that was until the emergence of Omicron. On Monday, the city of Toronto canceled plans for its employees to return to their offices. Members of the Ontario Public Service, who have been gradually returning to their offices since November, were told that plan is now on hold until February. And Toronto's financial district is also following suit. So what does this mean for employers? What does this mean for workers? Should employers still be asking employees to come back? And as a worker, do you have to? What are your rights? Here to break this all down are employment lawyer Daniel Lublin, partner at Witten and Lublin, David Zweig, associate professor of organizational behavior and human resources management at the University of Toronto, and Andrew Caldwell, HR advisory manager at Peninsula Human Resources and Health and Safety Consulting Firm for Small Businesses. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Andrew, let's start with you as someone who advises employers and small businesses on best practices. What do you advise? Well, right now it's what can you do? What can you afford? You're not actually instructed to have your employees work from home. It's suggested. So if you're an employer who can afford that or to actually allow for that, go for it. If you can't, then that's another option. We've got to look at all the options available to an employer, and that's becoming limited because you also have to worry about your health and safety. You have an obligation as an employer to ensure the safety of your employees, and if you can't do that, you have an unsafe workplace, which the, employer can re the employee can refuse to come to. So there's a lot of factors the employer needs to be aware of and know their rights as well as the employee's rights to, A, come out of this unscathed or at least somewhat above where they were are now, I should say. And when it comes to the legality of all this, Daniel, legally, what are an employee's rights? If, if they don't feel safe, do they have to return to work? Thanks for having me. Good evening. Um, I don't disagree with what Andrew said. In fact, I, I agree with it. Um, if an, a workplace is safe, yes, an employee has to return. And this we saw a lot of at the beginning of the pandemic where employees complained that the workplace wasn't necessarily safe. And I'd like to think by now, almost two years into the pandemic, that employers that had, that had put plans into place for individuals to come back to work had really thought through the contingencies to ensure that whatever they needed to do to, to demonstrate that it's a safe, and, uh, safe workplace where individuals don't necessarily have the risk of catching COVID, um, that they put those plans into place to ensure people. Um, the problem that I think is happening, number one, there was a lot of hysteria in, in the market today and yesterday, especially about employees who are fearful from coming back to work. But what I really caution against is a one-size-fits-all approach. Certain workplaces can make it work to have some people come back. Other workplaces, it's going to be a problem. So, David, uh, for organizations that were rolling out a gradual return to the office plan, uh, what does delaying that plan do for productivity or do things really remain status quo uh, at this point? Well, you know, uh, we plan and COVID laughs. So even though we made plans to uh, return to the, work for the workplace, um, obviously Omicron has thrown a wrench into all of those plans. Um, you know, it's not March 2020. It might feel a little bit like that, but, you know, we've been here before. We know that we can uh, work from home relatively effectively. We're tired. We're scared. Uh, we're sick of working from home, many of us, but we know that we can do it. So the situation is a little bit different now, and I think organizations are sending a strong message to their employees. Um, if they're saying to them, you know what, let's pump, pump the brakes a little bit and make sure that we get through the worst of this before we reconsider coming back to the workplace. David, also for employees who were anticipating the return to the office to be around people mm. socially, to get out of the house, what's the sure. mental impact of all this? And, and what will that mean for their productivity at home uh, in terms of pandemic mm -hmm. work from home fatigue? I think we all know that, uh, you know, we've all been struggling with uh, adapting to the situation that we've been in for almost two years now. Um, and we're all very tired of it. We miss uh, interacting with others, some more than others, but of course, we miss that interaction with our colleagues and with our friends. So of course it takes a toll. And so now it's more important than ever that we be very cognizant of the, the toll that's taking on employees and offer uh, or e offer even greater support than what we've been providing in order to help them deal with uh, the emotional toll of continuing uh, to be in the situation that we're in. 
Andrew, over to you. I know we've been uh, talking a little bit about this throughout the pandemic, but a lot of people have been arguing in the same way that we've seen situations with restrictions. People saying who are against uh, working from home saying this is going to be the new norm, uh, not necessarily forever, but for a very long time. What do you think this looks like in terms of a short and long term uh, timeline, this, this, this work from home trend that we're obviously seeing and we've been seeing for more than 18 months? I think we're in the, the spot where we are still seeing that trend. It is still happening. We're looking at more hybrid work environments where those who can work from home will be able to or a kind of a hotel desk situation where those who feel like they need to come in or you come in once a week and then you go home. We're going to see more of that if the employer can do it. And that's really the big question. A lot of businesses have come to these plans, have developed these structures that have been dealing with it over the last year and uh, almost two years now, actually two years next March, and we're at this stage where they've got these structures in place, but businesses need to get back on their feet. And so that's up to the business to decide where we're gonna go. I mean, downtown Toronto, we're already seeing the, the impact on the small businesses that were dependent upon the financial market. They were hoping for this boom back up in January. So now we're here kind of stuck and they're the ones feeling the the push just like the employees so as much as they want to protect their employees they need to also think about the business so we're at this stage where we've done it for so long we know what we're doing now it's not news to anybody but we need to start looking at the plan for when we come back and and i agree we need to pump the brakes a little bit but at the same time we need to be ready to press on the gas when that opportunity strikes Daniel, over to you. Can an employer uh, tell an employee not to go to sporting events or, or large events in general, for that matter? In my opinion, as long as the government is allowing the sporting events, is allowing concerts, even if it's at half capacity, is allowing restaurants to stay open, an employer shouldn't and can't be saying, you can't attend. Uh, if there is a restriction in place and if the government has said, um, we're, closing, we're closing these venues down, um, that is really where that change needs to happen. Um, in the meantime, while these things are open, employees should feel free to enjoy whatever it is that is open. I don't think it's for an employer to say, hey, you can't, you can't go to the hockey game tonight. And if there's a hockey game on and you have a ticket, um, because it's open. So um, it, it, I don't think it's for an employer to dictate where an employee can go if, it, if a venue is open. Andrew Caldwell, Daniel Lublin, David Zweig, thank you all so much for speaking with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.